Before anyone can ask, why are you covering unsolved mysteries? This iceberg topic has been covered into oblivion. Yes, I know that, but this iceberg in particular, created by Jimbo Seth, I have not seen been covered. And here's the kicker. It has over 1,000 entries, spanning across over a dozen subgenres of mysteries such as murders, puzzles, historical events, lost media, and much, much more. And it's oftentimes within these ultimate icebergs, as I like to call them, that we can discover the truly obscure topics that are rarely brought up. So this will be an ongoing series, probably going to span over 10 videos that are going to be 40 to 60 minutes each. Today, we're just going to cover part of layer one, which shows just how massive this iceberg really is. And as we dive deeper, we'll begin uncovering topics such as the French horse killing rituals, the monster of Udine, and the train defecator who caused tens of thousands of pounds worth of damage. So sit back and relax as we begin our adventure into this expansive Unsolved Mysteries iceberg. Albert Johnson, aka the Mad Trapper of Rat River, was the target of a massive manhunt in Canada which resulted in a shootout where Johnson would be fatally wounded. Now it should be noted that Albert Johnson is simply a pseudonym as the true identity still remains a mystery, hence why he's on the iceberg. Albert Johnson's entanglement with the police began when he was reported by native trappers that he was tampering with their traps. Albert would trigger them, then either break them or hang them up on the trees. The RCMP, aka the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, would trek about 60 miles into the snowy wilderness along the banks of the Rat River to confront Albert in his cabin for questioning. However, they would make this journey multiple times. The first time they approached Johnson's hut, he would simply refuse to talk to them altogether. When one of the constables, Alfred King, looked through the cabin window, Johnson would also place a bag across it. The two constables that visited Albert that day would eventually leave in order to return with a search warrant. About five days later, they would get their warrant and bring along two extra men. Again, Johnson refused to speak with anyone, forcing King to break down the cabin door. But as soon as he approached, Johnson would shoot King straight through the still closed door. Promptly after, a brief firefight would break out, followed by the retreat of the team. Luckily, King did get medical attention in time and he would eventually recover. Now, keep in mind this all stemmed from a simple trapping violation. The two men that confronted Johnson at first were simply going to find Johnson and then ask Johnson to purchase a trapping license and then be on their way. The RCMP would then assemble a pretty massive group for their third visit to Albert Johnson. The group would consist of nine men, numerous dogs, and then dynamite. The police would proceed to throw a stick of dynamite onto the roof of Johnson's cabin, which caused it to collapse. Following this, the men attempted to blitz Johnson, but he would open fire from a 5 foot dugout underneath his now ruined hut. This would lead to a 15 hour standoff where the group would eventually give up yet again and just retreat. The RCMP would return to Johnson's hut about a week later, but this time they would find that he is no longer there. Keep in mind this was taking place in January, so winter is now in full swing. The police would have a very tough time in locating Johnson, but eventually they would come across his camp where Johnson would shoot one of the police straight through his heart. I wish I could say that they captured Johnson here, but yet again he escaped. But in February, with the assistance of some air support, they would locate Johnson's trail and chase him down, yelling for him to surrender. Of course, Johnson refused and he threw himself into the snow and began opening fire. Eventually, the group would circle around Johnson and capture him, albeit he was fatally struck by a bullet which severed his spine, so the police were not able to bring him in for questioning. When the police dug through his possessions, all they found was $2,000 in Canadian currency, five small pearls, and just a little bit of gold. Nothing that hinted at the true identity of Albert Johnson at all. And although in modern times and throughout the years, there have been many theories and DNA tests to find out who Johnson really was, we still have no conclusive answer. And to this day, his identity still remains a mystery. This entry refers to a very strange mystery website, and I believe it's pronounced as Et Namu. The website has been around for a while now, even having its own dedicated subreddit, although it seems that this community has been inactive for the last few years. 
but when you first visit the site, you are greeted with a very eerie ambiance. And if you click around, eventually you'll come across some hidden links that will take you further into the site, and it becomes much more unsettling. These hidden links can be almost anything. Sometimes it's tucked away into a small corner of an image, and other times it's a random letter in a sea of words. It's estimated that there are over 1,000 pages and links, all leading to a brand new page of cryptic imagery. However, the website doesn't just stop at cryptic text and pictures. There are a ton of various math problems, some of which can be very convoluted. But the weird thing about these problems is they all seem to revolve around the number 9. And if you delve deep enough into the website, you will eventually come across a forum that is still active to this day. Some internet sleuths have said that the active forum members can come across as a bit condescending when it comes to new visitors finding the forums. Could this hint at the website being some sort of secret cult? Or is that just an over-romanticized shot in the dark? The owner of the domain is a man named David Dennison, who is an artist based out of the UK, and by observing some of his older works, we can see that he likes to dance around the topic of surrealism. So with this newfound knowledge of the domain owner being an artist, could that mean that this website is simply an art project? Possibly. As I said earlier, the website is still active and growing, and just to give you an idea of what sort of topics are discussed on these forums, feel free to pause the video on this screenshot. So to conclude this entry, I'll leave you all with a couple theories that I came across. The first being that this website was originally a community of people who gravitate towards David's art. Since his art is so abstract and can be interpreted in many different ways, it's totally understandable why the new domain holders would want to keep the site running so long after David's passing. The second theory is that this was all an elaborate art project with the combination of surreal art and esoteric puzzles slash messages. It's possible that David had something to say that he only wanted a select number of people to understand. Now, the third isn't exactly a theory, but rather a statement. On a video created by Elders Vault, Elders Vault said that he got in touch with a head forum member on the site, and after a long period of speaking with each other, the head member would eventually come out and say, the website is an illustration of the group's core beliefs. It's a slight glimpse into God and how God exists only in numbers and mathematical equations. Essentially saying that math is God and the number 9 is the best illustration of God that we have. Elders Vault added that this was the last time that the member would respond to his messages and he would be ghosted from that point on. Would You Could You on a Train refers to a train crash in the Hoboken train station on September 29th, 2016 in New Jersey. There were over 100 injuries as well as one casualty. Amongst the injured was the train operator known as Thomas Gallagher. Thomas would be visited by various entities including the FRA as well as the NTSB and they discovered Thomas was not able to recall anything that happened during or shortly before the accident. Thomas reported that he did not notice anything unusual in the moments before the accident Incident, and he went on to say that he felt well rested that day. The NTSB would release the findings from the black boxes within the wreckage later in October and they found that 38 seconds before the crash, Thomas would accelerate from 8 miles per hour to 21, which was twice the speed limit. It was also found that Thomas forgot to use the emergency brake and attempted to use it within less than a second from impact. Additionally, it was reported that the automatic emergency brake system was faulty so it did not properly engage. In in November of the same year, Thomas Gallagher's attorney would say that Thomas was suffering from undiagnosed sleep apnea, despite Thomas reporting to officials that he felt well rested. It should also be noted that the New Jersey Transit did have a sleep apnea screening program, but despite that, Thomas was cleared to work. And something else that I should mention about the exam is that it did take place in July, two months before the accident. So it's definitely possible that Thomas developed the sleep apnea later on. So now let's dive into the mystery part and it's a bit of a conspiracy. So two days before the actual crash, there would be this very odd warning on TV that went live on various televisions within New York, which is normally only about a 15 to 30 minute train ride from New Jersey. The warning notifies us of hazardous materials and gives us the date of September 29th, which was the same day of the accident. The warning would end with the question, would you, could you on a train? Which is definitely a very odd warning. It's tough to believe that someone such as Thomas Gallagher, who nearly has two decades worth of experience at the time, would simply forget the pull on the emergency brake. 
or if you're more on the side of the brake being tampered with, then it's also obviously very suspicious that the automatic brake system would not work on the same day of the accident. Thomas would of course be fired from his position, but I do believe that in 2019, he was actually brought back on. Some speculators do believe that this was all just a big coincidence, with the warning being a result of some hacker, while others believe that Thomas Gallagher was part of some sort of secret syndicate group or something, or at the very least, he was paid to cause the accident. Oumuamua was first discovered in October of 2017 by Canadian physicist and astronomer Robert Wuryik by using the Pan-STARRS telescope in Hawaii, and apologies if I absolutely butchered Robert's last name, but what exactly is Oumuamua? Well, we actually are not sure entirely, but it is described as a small object by space standards estimated to be no more than about 2,000 feet by 400 feet. What makes Oumuamua special though is it's a one-of-a-kind celestial body that has supposedly reached our solar system from another solar system. It's believed to just be some sort of exotic comet or asteroid, but some astronomers go as far as to say that it could be an abandoned alien spacecraft. I want to make it clear that the pictures that you guys are seeing are not actual photos that were taken of Aumuamua. They are simply illustrations and astronomers have no idea what it looks like up close, only that it seems to have a reddish surface. When Aumuamua was first discovered back in 2017, the sun's gravity was able to slow it down, but it was not strong enough to stop it entirely. As of January of this year, Aumuamua is no longer in range of earthly telescopes. However, a team of scientists have said they want to build a spacecraft to pursue it. They have named this effort Project Lyra, and it is estimated to reach Aumuamua as early as 2047. And just for reference, it was estimated that Aumuamua was traveling at about 59,000 miles per per hour. The 2001 anthrax attacks took place over the course of several months, beginning on September 18th, 2001, only one week after the 9-11 attack. And according to the FBI, this was one of the largest and most complex cases in the history of law enforcement. Letters containing anthrax spores would be mailed to various news media offices as well as a number of Democratic senators. These letters would result in the deaths of 5 people as well as the infection of over 20 others. In case you don't know what anthrax is, it's a rare bacterial illness that is caused by a spore forming bacterium that typically affects animals. But nevertheless, humans can still be affected. If the anthrax spores are inhaled, it becomes much harder to treat compared to other means of infection. And in case you're curious what the letters would say, I'll go ahead and throw a couple of them up on the screen for you to read. The first known victim of the anthrax attacks was Robert Stevens, who worked at the Sun tabloid. Robert would come into contact with one of the letters and immediately begin vomiting and being short of breath. He would be sent to a Florida hospital where he would pass away only four days later. However, the letter that Robert came into contact with was never found. As time went on, the culprit would adjust the way that the anthrax was being presented. In one letter that was discovered at the New York Post, the anthrax was a clumped up ball of brown granular material and appear to look similar to dog food. Afterwards, the anthrax would be turned into a highly refined powder of nearly pure spores, and as we learned earlier, inhalation is the most dangerous way to be infected. There were various suspects during the investigation of this case, such as Bruce Edwards Ivins, who was a scientist at the government's biodefense labs in Frederick, Maryland. Bruce would only become a suspect as of 2005, but in 2007 he was put under surveillance and the FBI labeled him as an extremely sensitive suspect in the 2001 anthrax attacks. In July of 2008, Ivans would take his own life with an overdose of Tylenol. Only a month later, federal prosecutors would declare that Ivan was the sole perpetrator based on DNA evidence that led to an anthrax vial within his lab. They declared that Bruce made the various anthrax powders using readily available laboratory equipment, and in 2010, the FBI formally closed the investigation of the anthrax attacks. Now, at a quick glance, it may seem as though Ivans was indeed the one responsible for the attacks. However, in 2008, the FBI requested a review of the scientific methods used in their investigations, and that report would not come out until 2011. The report would cast doubt on the conclusion that Bruce Ivans was the perpetrator and go on to say that there was not enough evidence to conclude that the anthrax used in the letters originated in Ivans' laboratory. And even if it did come from Ivan's lab, many experts disagree that Ivan 
Divens was the one responsible as at least 10 other scientists were regularly found accessing the lab with the anthrax stock. The FBI would later claim that they identified over 400 people at the Fort Derrick lab in Maryland who had access to the lab. So while it was formally concluded that Bruce Evans was the culprit, there is enough evidence to also argue that he was innocent or at the very least not the only one responsible. This topic is huge and has so many nuances and other details that I wasn't able to cover. If I did include them, this entry by itself could span across like at least 30 minutes plus. So definitely give this topic a read on your own time if you find it interesting. Back around 2019, this clip shot on a doorbell camera of a woman screaming went viral. This incident was caught in the southwest area of Los Angeles around 11.30 p.m. It isn't until around the 22nd mark where we can finally see a vehicle where a suspected male would force an African American female into the front passenger seat. One witness reported they saw the suspect pulling the unidentified female by her dark braided hair as she was screaming, as well as seeing plastic wrap covering the front passenger side window. The vehicle has been identified as a white Toyota Matrix, but it is unclear which year this car was made. Police have come out and said that they are not sure if this was a kidnapping or a domestic incident, but nothing has indicated that it's a hoax. Some people have proposed that this could have all been some sort of marketing ploy for a movie or something, but that doesn't make very much sense as no one came out to claim that they were responsible, thus making it hard to justify that this was some sort of sick attempt at gaining clout. And apologies that I can't really provide anything else for this entry as there really is little information known about this. A858 is a subreddit that was discovered over a decade ago. The following text on the screen is the full name of the subreddit. When visiting the subreddit, you would find long strings of seemingly random combinations of letters and numbers. Obviously, the first thing people would assume this to be is some sort of code. So groups of university students, code breakers, and various internet sleuths would come together in an attempt to decipher the mystery of A858. One day, users would notice someone posting hexadecimal chains in the r slash solving a858 subreddit that matched with the original subreddit. Shortly after, users would find out that the owner of the original group was hosting an AMA in code, so moderators would set up scripts in order to more seamlessly communicate with the owner of a858. When asked why they decided to break their silence, the owner simply answered with, the audience was getting frustrated. Additionally, when asked what the point of this puzzle was, the host would reply, we cannot disclose the purpose. Purpose, A858 will end when the purpose is disclosed or discovered. Fast forward now to about 5 years to 2016, an account that goes by Team W Mod would surface inside the r slash solving A858 subreddit. They would create a post saying that the A858 project has ended and any future efforts made to solve the mystery would be in vain, as the information available to the public is not sufficient to solve all outstanding puzzles. The moderators of the solving subreddit would confirm that Team W Mod was indeed an owner of the the original subreddit. Shortly after this, the Team W mod account would be deleted and the main A8 subreddit would be set to private. But our story doesn't exactly end here. A couple Reddit users were able to get in touch with one of the people behind A858 and they said they were paid by a separate entity to post various code puzzles using encryption or other methods of text manipulation. This John Doe would go on to say that even they themselves were unaware of the true purpose of the project, but they simply did as they were told. Additionally, this person would say that the reason that the project was shut down was simply because the company responsible didn't want to fund the project anymore. Why that is, we are not sure. Another two years later, in 2018, the original subreddit would be reopened, but this time the account that went by the same name would be deleted and a new moderator would take their place. But after a week, the subreddit again would be closed and has been ever sense. Of course, there are many theories regarding why this subreddit ever came to existence, but it seems like the one most people agree with is that A858 was all a recruitment program. Whoever the company was that commissioned the project wanted to bring on talented individuals that were proficient in cryptography or cybersecurity to bring on into their staff.
If you guys have not heard of Mr. Cruel before, I'd like to give a content warning as this guy is absolute scum. We're going to be talking about cases involving minors, so that should tell you all that you need to know. If that makes you uncomfortable, I totally understand, so please skip forward to the above timestamp. So if you're still here, Mr. Cruel is the alias given to an Australian child who attacked at least three girls in the 1980s and early 90s. Obviously, Mr. Cruel has never been identified and all three confirmed cases have not led to any sort of progression when it comes to finding this man. Mr. Cruel would always wear a mask when assaulting his victims and the only thing that we have to go off of is this police sketch based on what one of the victims remembers seeing. He's described as a highly intelligent and meticulous person, having even gone as far as leaving red herrings to divert the attention of the victim's families and the police. Mr. Cruel is believed to have videotaped and photographed his victims during the attacks, and detectives believe that if he is still alive today, he is likely involved in some sort of underground child ring. And knowing how advanced technology is nowadays, I wouldn't doubt that this monster is still repeating these despicable actions and ruining the lives of minors. The strange thing about Mr. Cruel is that he releases his victims. In one case, he abducted a girl named Sharon Wills and told her that she would be released in about 18 hours. Once that time ran out, he indeed did release her, even going as far as to carefully bathe her so that there are no traces of his DNA. There are theorists who believe that Mr. Cruel could be the Golden State Killer as they both share strikingly similar tactics and routines when it comes to abducting people. Mr. Cruel first began assaulting minors in 1987, which is about a year after the sudden disappearance of the Golden State Killer. However, Australian police would rule out the possibility of them being the same person. While it is unlikely, I really hope that there will come a day where authorities are finally able to capture this monster, assuming he is even still alive. This entry is pretty self-explanatory. Everyone, regardless if you're religious or not, have heard or even given thought to the idea of an afterlife, a plane of existence for once we die. But of course, it's impossible to know what really happens to us once we pass away. In 2008, a large-scale study conducted by the University of Southampton was launched. It involved over 2,000 patients from 15 different hospitals in the UK, the US, and Austria. And of course, take what I'm about to say with a grain of salt. What the university found was that when patients experienced a near-death situation, they were able to retain a perception of awareness where they can somewhat recall their actual death. This is what would be reported by 39% of the patients who survived would say when they went through structured interviews afterwards. Additionally, it should be noted that pretty much all of them couldn't recall explicit events during that time. Honorary researcher Dr. Parnia would go on to say that this suggests more people may have mental activity initially but then lost their memories after recovery, either due to the effects of brain injury or sedative drugs. Among the patients that reported a perception of awareness, 46% would say that they experienced a broad range of recollections in relation to death that were not compatible with the commonly used term of near-death experience, while only 2% would exhibit full awareness with explicit recall of seeing and hearing events. I won't spend too much time on this entry as Amelia Earhart is one of the more famous figures in American history, but for my audience that is not based in the US or if you simply need a refresher on Earhart, I'll provide some brief background info. Amelia Earhart was born in 1897 in Kansas and is famous for being the second person to fly solo and non-stop across the Atlantic, as well as being the first person to fly solo and non-stop across the entire US. But what makes her story truly perplexing is how she went missing on her journey around the world. In May of 1937, Amelia Earhart along with her navigator Fred Noonan would begin a round-the-world flight which began in California. The aircraft that they would be taking on this journey would be a twin-engine Lockheed Electra. But in July of that year, only two months after the journey began, Amelia and Fred would disappear near Howland Island. Rescue parties would be sent out, but of course, they would not be able to find either Fred or Amelia. And around 2019 to 2021, there were some plane wreckages found underwater, but no one could say with confidence that any of these wrecked planes were Amelia's, as the Electra she piloted was very popular at the time. So in that case, what happened to Amelia and Fred? There are many theories as to what happened to Amelia, one of which is called the crash and sink theory, which suggests that Amelia's aircraft simply ran out of fuel and then crashed into the ocean before being swallowed up by the sea. The duo was aiming to land on Howland Island, but unfortunately, the 
Electra probably ran out of fuel and just wasn't able to make it. If for whatever reason I was forced to pick a theory as to what happened to Amelia, I probably would pick this one as it's oftentimes the most simplest reasoning that is true. But if you're more of a speculator, some people suggest that Amelia was actually shot down by Japanese military forces or at the very least was captured by Japanese. A common criticism you will find if you tend to lean towards this theory is that the Marshall Islands controlled by the Japanese were pretty far from Howland Island, and in order to reach them, Fred and Amelia would need to completely veer off course as they began to close in on Howland Island. Then there's the castaway theory that suggests Earhart and Noonan landed their plane on, and I apologize if I butcher this name, but they may have landed on Nikuma Roro Island. The two would live on the island for a short stint before passing away from dehydration and starvation. Additionally, this theory often brings up the topic of bones being found rumored to be from Amelia. But if none of these float your boat, then there is one other theory. Aliens. Completely baseless, but definitely the most fun to shoot the shit about. Amy Lynn Bradley is an American woman who went missing during a Caribbean cruise in 1998. One night during the cruise, Amy and her brother Brad would visit the ship's nightclub and eventually retire for the day, and then head back to their cabin. Brad would enter the cabin at about 3.35am, while Amy followed 5 minutes later. When Amy's father woke up around 6am to check on his daughter, he would find that she had gone missing from her room. Immediately, he began searching and notified the crew who got the Coast Guard involved. They would conduct a 4-day search in the the surrounding waters thinking that she may have fallen overboard on the balcony and drowned. However, many investigators would reject this possibility as Amy was known to be a proficient swimmer. The crew members would scour the ship and send out multiple announcements asking for Amy to report to the staff, but unfortunately, no luck. Eventually, the Coast Guard would send out three additional helicopters as well to assist in the case, but yet again, they came short of finding Amy. Some theorists believe that Amy was actually kidnapped and sold into the Caribbean trafficking industry. This theory would be somewhat strengthened with the reported sightings of Amy residing within a brothel in the Caribbean. Multiple residents and Navy officers would report having sighted a woman that looked strikingly similar to Amy. This theory goes a bit deeper and suggests that the band slash staff also played a role in her disappearance. Throughout the night, the same waiter would persistently approach Amy's family multiple times, asking for them to pass on a note to Amy, which invited her for a drink with the waiter. Earlier, I said that Amy's father went to check on her at 6am, but I did leave out the part that said he also went to check on her at around 5.30am, and at that time, she was still sleeping. So whoever took Amy, if she even was abducted, had to have worked in that 30 minute window. And we are aware that the crew has a log of when the cabin doors open, so it's possible that the crew indeed played a role in her disappearance. Then the final theory is that Amy took her own life by willingly stepping off of the balcony. And as you all likely know, the longer these missing persons cases go on, the more unlikely it is that they actually survived. The Axeman of New Orleans was a serial killer active in Louisiana from May of 1918 to late 1919, and to this day, the identity of this murderer is still unknown. The Axeman mainly targeted Italian Americans and Italian immigrants, specifically females. It's hypothesized that the women were the main target of the murderer and he would only kill men when they got in the way of his intended victim. As the name would suggest, this murderer would use an axe to kill his targets while they slept in their beds, and oftentimes the axes that he would use would be the ones that he finds in the victim's own homes. Additionally, whenever the axeman was finished with the victim, he wouldn't take anything from their homes, suggesting that the man was a sadist of sorts and derived pleasure from taking others' lives. Like with many obscure mystery serial killers, there aren't many plausible theories as to who the culprit is, and that is especially so with the Axeman, as most of the theories proposed had lots of holes, and the case overall is just very old. For example, one theory suggested that the Axeman was a man named Joseph Momfrey, who was shot to death in Los Angeles in 1920 by the widow of Mike Pepitone, who is one of the Axeman's victims. However, this theory would kind of be debunked as a true crime writer named Michael Newton, would search the LA courtrooms and fail at locating any evidence of a Joseph Momfrey being killed in LA. Another theory suggests that the Axeman had some sort of connection with the Mafia and therefore had an easy time staying hidden. But regardless of what theory you lean towards, it's nearly impossible now for us to learn the identity of the Axeman. 
The clown sightings of 2016 was definitely one of the strangest phenomena that I experienced. In 2016, there were reports of people dressed as evil clowns in really odd locations, such as forests, schools, and playgrounds, just to name a few. Moreover, these incidents were not limited to the US. There were numerous reports of these clowns in Canada as well as the UK. However, it was the largest within the US. The clown sighting that started all of this turned out to simply be a marketing stunt for a horror film being shot in Wisconsin, but for whatever reason, others would begin donning clown attire and in some cases they would attack people in nearly every state in the US. Social media would amplify the effects of the clown sightings as more people would begin joining in with the attempt to go viral and get some clout. Now, it's not like dressing up as a clown and walking around in public was a brand new thing. In 2013, three local filmmakers from England would dress up as a creepy clown to drive traffic to their Facebook page. In 2014, Italian YouTuber DM pranks would begin dressing up as an evil clown to scare civilians which would earn him hundreds of millions of views. But for whatever reason, 2016 would mark the largest event involving clowns. The earlier mentioned Wisconsin filmmakers would post five pictures of clowns roaming in an empty parking lot which went viral and marked the beginning of hundreds to thousands of additional clown sightings in other states. But due to the chaotic nature of this drawn out event, it was extremely tough to identify and capture those that took this charade too far. Angel hair, aka salicious cotton, is a sticky fibrous substance that resembles a spider web. One day in a small town in France, something would loom over the town and many people would call this a UFO. Shortly upon arriving, the quote-unquote UFO would begin emitting a strange web-like material. Extraterrestrial enthusiasts would theorize that this stuff comes from ionized air sleeting off an electromagnetic field which surrounds a UFO. But of course, skeptics would disagree and a few explanations would promptly be brought to attention. The first and likely most plausible explanation is that this was exactly what it looked like, spiderweb. And what the people saw in the sky was not a UFO, but rather a colony of spiders migrating. Yes, apparently spiders can fucking fly, or at the very least, they they can slowly descend. In order to migrate, spiders will raise their abdomens to the sky and begin extruding strands of silk before floating away. And there are certain species of spiders that do live and travel in groups, so it's very likely that this material all came from a group of spiders. In fact, in England and in other parts of the northern hemisphere, dwarf spiders can be found frequently causing showers of their own thread. But nevertheless, some people are still dead set on the idea that this substance was from aliens. Ball lightning is a rare and unexplained phenomenon described as luminescent spherical objects that vary from pea size to several meters in diameter. These balls of lightning are typically associated with thunderstorms, but they last considerably longer than the split second flash of a lightning bolt. After a short amount of time, these balls of lightning would explode and leave behind an odor resembling that of sulfur. Descriptions of ball lightning vary quite drastically, but for the most part, people who have reported sighting it have reported that it moves sporadically, side to side, up and down, and generally unpredictable trajectories. Additionally, some people said that this ball could move objects, while others described it as destructive. Instead of stopping when being met by an object, it would simply burn a hole through it and continue on its path. For now, we don't really have a widely accepted explanation for ball lightning, but there is a hypothesis that proposes that the ball of lightning is made up of vaporized silicone that is burning through oxidation. When lightning strikes Earth's soil, it vaporizes the silica contained within it, which somehow separates the oxygen from the silicon dioxide, turning it into pure silicon vapor. And as the silicon cools, it would condense into a floating aerosol and begin glowing due to the heat reassembling with oxygen. The Baltic Sea Anomaly is this structure that can be found in the Baltic Sea. This strange object was first discovered by Peter Lindbergh and his Swedish Ocean X diving team in 2011 and has left many onlookers confused as to what exactly caused the formation of this structure. The various details look much too meticulous to have not been made by intelligent life, as they would say, such as the strange stair formations which made Lindbergh propose the idea that this was constructed tens of thousands of years ago before the Ice Age. And Lindbergh 
Kubrick isn't completely detached from the possibility that this is simply a very strange natural formation, such as a meteor penetrating through an iceberg during the Ice Age. But regardless of what anyone proposes, scientists are completely baffled by it. Some speculators like to lean into the idea that this structure could be part of an Atlantis-like civilization. Not necessarily saying that the underwater city of Atlantis is real, but rather proposing that there was once a city here that was claimed by the sea over time. And another more reasonable proposition is that this anomaly is a glacial basin. The divers gave an associate geology professor at Stockholm University samples of the stone they found and he said that it could be volcanic rock. Volker would add that while it is out of place, it is not unusual to discover hardened lava under the sea in the Baltic region. The Battle of Los Angeles is the name given to a supposed attack on the US by Imperial Japan in 1942. The incident occurred only three months after the US entered World War II and as I said earlier, it was thought to be the Japanese doing the attack. But the Secretary of the Navy at the time, Frank Knox, labeled the attack as a false alarm. This topic of course would take over newspaper headlines at the time and many speculators would call this a cover-up. The US Coast Artillery Association identified a meteorological balloon around 1am and have labeled that incident to be what sparked everything. Military forces would begin to open fire at the object and quote, once the firing started, the imagination created all kinds of targets in the sky and everyone joined in. Later in 1983, the US Office of Air Force History would attribute the events to a case of war nerves. Basically, everyone at the time was on edge due to the war that the US joined in on and were somewhat paranoid. It didn't help that at the time, there was actually a warning that there may be an attack on California, so there were flashing lights and flares all around. When the first couple people shot at the balloon thinking it was an enemy aircraft, others would promptly join in out of paranoia without taking the time to actually assess just what they were looking at. When World War II finally ended, the Japanese government would say that they had not flown any aircraft over Los Angeles during the war, which is what made the US declare that it was a balloon that caused the initial alarm. And as I said at the beginning, many people would call this a cover-up and would say that this was actually the US hiding an alien interaction. This image here would be pointed to as having searchlights targeting a UFO, but would later be said to have been heavily retouched before it was published by newspapers. So who knows, was it really aliens and the government was covering it up, or was it actually a paranoid shootout on a balloon? So that's going to mark the end of part one of this series and we still have like over 100 or so topics before we are even done with layer one, which is just crazy. If you made it through until here, thank you so much for your time. And if you enjoyed the video, leaving a like would really help me out. And if you'd like to get some more content right now while I work on part two, feel free to click on one of the videos on the right. And shout out to my editor who helped me edit a large chunk of this video. I should be able to put these videos out a bit quicker now, now that I actually have real help on my end. So with that being said, I'll talk to you all again very soon.